Yeah. All right. Uh, let me close that. Okay. So we're not getting echo. <laughs> All right. We are live and we are recording. Okay. So let me just, uh, okay. We're all set. All right. Welcome back, my friends, to the Mail Right Real Estate Agent Podcast Show. This is episode 96. And I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Whitney Nicely, who's joining us today. Whitney, would you uh, please give people the Reader's Digest introduction of yourself? Yes, I guess we can start with, I'm a broker for Whitney Buys Houses. And just like it sounds, I buy houses. I don't list houses. I'm an investor and I do lease options subject to owner financing, all the creative kind of fun stuff. Uh, occasionally I pay cash, but I use somebody else's money and uh, try to make money at the same time. Okay. I'm also an auctioneer and a general contractor. I'm heavily licensed. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, my illustrious co-host, Jonathan Denwood, is here. Jonathan, would you tell people who you are? Yes, but Thomas, am I heavily licensed? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to need a couple extra licenses pretty <laughs> soon because of you. I oh, just hope so. <laughs> we need live it up, don't you? I'm, I'm, hi there, folks. I'm the founder and CEO of Mail Riot where we offer a software solution to help you, the reader, to get the quality leads that you deserve. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, and I'm Thomas J. Nelson. I'm a residential realtor in America's finest city, San Diego, California, and I do buy and sell houses, um, but I also help investors, so I'm excited to talk to Whitney, and if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so through my website at thomasjnelsonrealtor.com. All right, Whitney, thank you for joining us this morning, and I'm excited to get into our questions here. Um, I want to first talk to you about who is your typical client? Who are you typically having ring you up or email you and say, I need your help? Well, because I buy houses, I don't list them. My sellers are usually tired landlords or they've inherited a property or uh, they were accidental landlords and now they're tired landlords. <laughs> um, so between tired landlords and inherited properties, I buy as many houses as I can stand. Gotcha. And now what's, how do they uh, know about you? I mean, you obviously you have a website, but I mean, what do you do to advertise yourself and reach out? I have about six different ways to find off market properties. And one of them is mailing letters, but I haven't done that in about two years now. Sorry. Huh? <laughs> um, but I do a lot of Facebook. I do a lot of like um, just word of mouth advertising. I tell everybody anywhere I am that I buy houses uh, and you'd be surprised, you know, I wore, I've got shirts that say Whitney buys houses. I've got buttons that say I buy houses. And you'd be really surprised walking through the grocery store or Sam's or going to pick up the kids, how many people have real estate problems and they'll just start puking them out on you. If you break the ice and say, hi, I can help you. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, what part of the country do you hail from? <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. All right. I thought I heard a little <laughs> accent there. <laughs> I speak very fluent redneck. <laughs> nice. Well, um, uh, let me ask you this. Are you, are you only doing oh, this? I, I just want to interrupt folks and just say I speak very fluent proper English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know about that. I hear Jonathan mispronounce things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so do you uh, work only out of Nashville or do, are you uh, working in other states? Or how, No, it's how, Knoxville. I'm, I'm in oh. Nashville's little brother. Ah, ah, Knoxville. Okay, gotcha. See, when, when the country, when there's any kind of national press about real estate in Tennessee, it's Nashville and then Memphis, which is amazing because that means nobody's paying attention to Knoxville. Ah, okay. And my buddies and I get to go buy everything. Uh, so <laughs> so you're, you're the best kept secret there. <laughs> All right. Don't tell anybody. All right. Except for people that want to sell, I assume. That's right. All right. That's right. If you inherited something in Knoxville, call me. <laughs> so now when you're selling these homes for, for folks that um, they find themselves in possession of a home they don't want to own anymore, um, who, who's your end buyer? Are you, are you uh, working with wholesalers or, or end users? I don't wholesale. I only did one wholesale deal and it was a disaster. I only made $3,000. It's absolutely pathetic oh. and I, I, I can't stand it. So I, I get deals that they, most of the time 
people think they want to cash out and get a big lump of money, but a lot of times they don't really want that at all. And so I help them realize that and that they want monthly income. So I agree to send them either, you know, what their mortgage payment is or maybe just a squidge more. Or, you know, if it's free and clear, we come to an agreement on, you know, if I'll send you payments and pay it off in a couple years, or I'll have a balloon payment in a couple years and then cash you out, that's all good. So my tenant buyers that I'm going to have moving into these houses, because I, I do sandwich lease options, so I'll get a lease option from my seller and then I'll sell my lease option to my tenant buyer. Gotcha. A lot of them have bad credit or they just moved to the area and they need to establish their job history so they can have their... Uh, you know, two years of W-2s to go get a mortgage or, you know, they had a bankruptcy during the recession and they're just now coming over it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a lot of people got divorced and so-and-so ruined my credit and this and that and the other. Or some people have people in their family, they got sick. And so they took out huge lines of credit to pay hospital bills and it just messed them up on paper. They're good people. They've got good jobs. They make good money, but they can't get a mortgage right now. In fact, I think it's like, 18 or 19 percent of Americans that can get pre-approved and go do the regular mortgage process. Wow. So I work with everybody else. Okay. So now can you just give us like kind of the nuts and bolts of how that is structured from your end to the uh, the person that's uh, leasing to own? So that all goes through the hands of the attorney. Okay. I've got some contracts that I use. Um, I've got just a little one pager dinky thing that I use. It gets all the, you know, big stuff out of the way, like our purchase price and when we're going to pay it off. And if I'm giving them any money, most of the time I don't give them anything down. Uh, But when I start making the payments, I usually get 90 days before I have to start making the payments and it it gets all of that kind of out of the way. Okay which gives me enough that I can start marketing the property and showing the property and trying to find somebody who's either going to beat what I've got on contract so that I can make money right. on the uh, monthly income and on the down payment and on the purchase price, or I'll put it out there and find out that what I thought would happen isn't good. So I have to go back to my seller and renegotiate. Oh, okay. But after I get both sides of those on my little dinky one or two pager, I take it to the attorney and he attorneys it into you <laughs> okay. know, 20 pages or better. So basically it's like you're, you're getting seller financing on your end and then you're giving a, a, a lease to own option on the other end. Absolutely. Okay. And once, once I get it from the seller, then I go ahead and file mine with the county so that the title has been clouded. Right. So that I'm protected and so that they know I'm serious and that they won't try to sneak around my back. Right. Okay. So now what got you into this? I mean, were you a realtor first and then you did this? Tell me your story. Okay. So I I got my real estate license and it was like 18 months before I got my first listing. And then it was, you know, three months to close and I made 1200 bucks and then I had to pay my broker. And I was like, I am never going to be rich. (laughs) Uh, So I decided, you know, my family, they've always been real estate investors. My mom's been buying houses for longer than I've been alive Uh. but she is old school cash buy and hold hope and pray one day she's (laughs) making money and I couldn't stand it I needed a formula I needed a plan I needed a strategy but I didn't know that I just thought well I got some money let's go see what I can buy and eventually I'll be making money too well once I figured out some formulas and calculated it it was going to be I bought two houses with cash and then I figured out there's a formula to this stuff and it was going to be like 115 years before I got my money back and started making money. Seriously, like 115 years. <laughs> and I was like 27 and I was like, I don't have 15 minutes. I need money now. <laughs> like what have I gotten myself into? And so I was out of money, but I had two houses and I needed more money. And then lease options happened. Uh, I joined the local RIA group in Knoxville Okay. and they did a special lease option presentation and the president was like, you need to go to that. And I was like, I'm broke. I just bought two houses. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to learn anything else. I have a real estate license. Surely I'm smart enough. So he told me that he would pay me back if I didn't like what I learned. Uh. And within 15 minutes, I was head over heels in lease options and I'd signed myself up to go to a boot camp in Florida and drop three grand on my credit card. I mean, like that, I just, it, it just spoke to me in all sorts of ways. 
And then, um, so that was, I went to my first boot camp in December. I went to the second one in February, two weeks after I got back from the second boot camp, because the first one, I was just so confused. You know, it's like a, a fire hydrant. They're just yeah. spewing everything at you. So it took me a, a little bit to get like, understand what they were saying. And I yeah. had a license. I thought I was smart. I graduated college. I thought I knew everything. I was 27, you know? So after I left, I got home like Valentine's day, maybe February 15th, like really close, but February 28th, I got my first contract. And by the first of May, I'd cashed it out, made $15,000. And I was like, yes, we are on to something. This is so much better than listing houses. And, you know, I didn't even get to keep that house. So I didn't get any monthly money, but on the next couple, I got to make, you know, 15 or 20,000 up front. I was going to make 15 or 20,000 on the purchase price. And I was making like 200 and 500 on the deals that I did. And I figured out that the two houses I originally bought, I put those out for lease options and what was going to take 115 years is taking three. Wow. So now how long have you been doing this? Since 2014, three years. 2014. Wow. Yeah, I've done, I think, 54 deals. I got confused. I've, I've done like six, I think, this year, and I bought and sold and flipped, and I, I'm confused on where we are, but it's 50-something. Nice. Well, and so none of it's buy and hold for you, though. It's just all, it's all lease option. That's your, that's your strategy. Well, the lease option, I mean, not buy it, hold it, and forget about it. The lease options I'm keeping for two, five, 10, oh, I got okay. one for 15 years. So I've got long time, long terms on gotcha. them, but you know, I do, I do that. I don't like to keep them for less than a year because then I'm short term capital gains on it. And right. that ain't fun. Right. Okay. So now let me get back to the question I asked you earlier. Cause I'd like to get some more details. Like okay. what, when um, I'm a marketing junkie, so I got to know what, what are you doing sp- in your Facebook ads and, and other advertising to entice people to, to, to check it out and call I'm, you? I'm not smart enough to figure out Facebook ads. Like I've been dink, like tinkering around with it in the last month. Okay. I have uh, 12 different templates to get sellers from my personal page and mm. sometimes from my business page. And sometimes if it's working good on my personal page or my business page, I'll boost it. Okay. Um, but I just, I, I don't understand the page manager and I've taken two different Facebook classes. I, I don't get it. I don't know. I can understand real estate and I can nerd out on that, but Facebook yeah. completely confuses me. Well, you know, that's actually probably a relief for most people listening. Because, <laughs> I mean, if you're having this level of success with that, with very little understanding of the technology <laughs> behind it, that there's no excuse, right? And I'm a millennial. <laughs> I'm supposed to like think like a computer and I can't. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that millennial label, that's a broad stroke, I think. You know? <laughs> I, I know our, our, our generation likes to, to um, complain about millennials, but I tell you, I've had uh, a couple millennials work for me as assistants and they've taught me so much. And if you're open to learn, it doesn't matter how old they are. They ever, you know, you just get, you got to be open to learning. Well, I tell people that I don't care how awesome Facebook is. It's still a, a puppy and a pen and paper and a good conversation with somebody is right. never going to go out of style. And it spreads like wildfire, especially here in the South. I mean, you tell one loud mouth <laughs> and everybody's going to know by the end of the day <laughs> on Facebook or not, you know? Now, what kind of, uh, did you get any kind of pushback from uh, other realtors or a broker? I mean, what was that like? They hate me. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, you're probably ruffling some feathers there. (laughs) They hate me because as adults, we have so much pride and we've gone to school and we have kids and we have people that look up to us and we've got our area of expertise Mm -hmm. and lease options were not on the exam to get a real estate license and therefore they're done learning. You know, that's how I was. I I had my license. I didn't need to know anything else. But then when, you know, I felt like the world was open to me to the investor side of life, I couldn't turn back. And they just haven't come out of that box yet. But, you know, I fully believe, too, that most people get a real estate license to become investors. They think it's the shortcut or the inside track. And it's not. It's chasing the clear to close. I'm sorry. I'm down in on agents. But, (laughs) you know, I mean, 
it doesn't create any residual money. It doesn't create any monthly money. You actually have to buy a house and know what you're doing with it to get paid every month. If you have one closing this month and one closing next month and then no closings for three months, you're SOL unless you have a portfolio of right. five or $10,000 coming at you to float you into the meantime. Yep. The mailbox money's nice. I mean, the inbox uh, money and just the direct deposit money is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's nice too. <laughs> my mama likes mailbox money though. And I grew up, you know, I grew up as the investor's kid. Like I grew up the way my students want their kids to grow up. Like I thought everybody just had money in the mailbox at the first of the month. I yeah. didn't realize that we were different. And that's how most people want their kids to grow up. Just knowing that money comes in, money happens. We invested some, but we know how much is coming back and we're going to live off that. And that's how mom can stay home. Or that's how we got dad to come home from the corporate job. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, and that's the big trap in real estate is, you know, you can have a windfall month and then you tend to go out and celebrate a little too much. And then you have a, a couple months down and all of a sudden you're struggling again. And the panic sits in and you yeah. take anything and everything you can get. Yeah, but if we had monthly money to bridge that. Yep. Diversify. Oh, it's, it's so much better. And you know, the way I do lease options, it's, it's, I paid a, I bought a house last month while I was in Florida at one of the Facebook conferences. I bought a house for 480 bucks. Wow. You don't need a hundred thousand dollars. You don't need $10,000. You don't need a whole lot of money to buy houses and, start creating that monthly money. I can rent this house for 800 bucks. So even if I don't get an option fee, I'm doubling down on my monthly payments. Their monthly payment is 480 and they were completely stressed out over it. So I made the monthly payment for them. I'll get somebody to give me 10,000 to move into the house, which will give me my 480 back right. and they'll rent it for $800. So All I'm right. doubling all my money every month almost. So now, so this house is in Florida, so you work out of state? No, I was oh. in Florida buying in Tennessee. Oh, okay. You don't even have to be where your houses are. <laughs> you don't need any money. You don't need any special technology. I mean, I wrote it out, faxed it to them. I, I took a picture and sent it to their fax. <laughs> so... Uh, what's what's the reach of your business? Like, how, how, how much of, of ten, uh, Tennessee do you cover? Three counties. Three counties. Okay. I have little honey holes in three different counties and I, I kind of snail from there. So I got one house and then I go all the way around that neighborhood and then all the way around the next neighborhood and then all the way around, you know, so I get in a spot. I'm like a big fish in a small pond. Gotcha. And basically wherever I can get my first foot in the door, I just snail from there. <laughs> gotcha. So now um, are, are you training other people how to do this? Like I noticed your website. So um, how are people coming to you? Like, are they, are they finding you because they're also in real estate or are you getting a lot of people that don't even have a license? The ladies that come to me are agents. Okay. I'll say, I mean, seven out of 10 of my ladies are agents and they've realized that this isn't doing what they thought it was going to do. The men that find me are typically uh, nine to five corporate guys who want to set up some protection and provide for their family long term. They don't want to quit their nine to five. My right. ladies don't typically want to quit agenting. Everybody wants to do this on, on the side. And I teach people that if you do one deal a month, which is like nothing and not hard at all, you can make 10,000 off of it and maybe two to 500 a month. Well, even on the low end, if you do one house a month, and you make 200 a month off of it, that's an extra 2,400 a month coming in. On the high end, if you do it and you make 500 on each deal, that's by the end of it, 6,000 coming in every month that you've already worked for. All you got to do is collect it. Yeah. So now, um, what, what, what does it cost to work with you and, and what's the time frame that you're, you're signing up for? Well, see, that's the thing. It doesn't take any money to buy houses, but it takes money for me to teach you how to buy right. houses. So, so, I mean, what, it, it, I mean, do you, do you have a, like a certain period of time that people sign up for? Um, I, I pretty much start whenever you start. I okay. try, I've got it broken down into 12 weeks because I talk okay. a lot and there's a lot to relearn and there's a lot of processes and I give you, 
you know, templates for advertising mm -hmm. and scripts and icebreakers and, you know, things you should say, how to look at the houses, how to do a visual inspection on the first go round. Uh, and I break it down into either a group program or a one on one. And I'll tell you the group program, it, it's a 12 week, but that's a booster. It's a year long thing. Okay. And so you're in with me for a year and it's okay. 5,000 for the group right now. Okay. Um, my one on one is 10. Gotcha. Okay. So um, now let me um, ask you this. So the um, people that come to you and, and the, uh, how, what's like the longest you've had a student so far? Like what, who's your, who's your longest term student? How long have they worked with you? Uh, I think Selena has been with me for a year. She's in California and uh, she's a stay at home mom and her and her husband are trying to do one deal a month. Uh, I think out of the last year though, they've done maybe four or five. Okay. Four, four or five out of 12 months. Yeah. Okay. I was, that's what I was getting at. It's just what kind of success you're seeing your students have. Well, it's all, it all depends on who it is. Like I had a lady last month, her name's Ashley. She joined last month and she's already done two deals. Wow. Okay. So I, I would imagine some of it depends on where they are in the country too, because the markets are different. It, it does. Uh, my California students usually buy out of California. Yeah, I would imagine. You know, <laughs> they're buying in Colorado and Mississippi and Ohio and Florida and Texas and anywhere but California. Yeah. Um, a lot of my rednecks here in the South, we buy right where we are because it's amazing to buy right yep. here. Um, I've got a guy in New York, though, but it, it all depends on the person and it all depends on how much time they'll give me. I, I require 10 to 15 hours a week. Okay. But I don't have a time clock. So right. the only way I know if you're giving it to me is if you're doing deals. Okay. So, so this does work universally across the country. Um, I, now, are the folks that are doing it, say, in California, are they using attorneys also? Or are they just doing it through title and escrow companies? Or It depends on uh, the state, the county that they're in. You know, in Tennessee and Georgia, we use attorneys. Right. Uh, in Kansas, you use title companies. Right. It, it just depends on where you are, but I want you to be protected because each state, each county has different laws. Um, some counties, some states are going to tell you that it's illegal to do this, and some are going to tell you that you have to have a license to do this, and some are going to tell you that they don't care what happens as long as nobody sues anybody. Okay. Well, let's so talk all of that depends on where you are. Okay. Yeah. I think we should go for our, our break, Thomas. Then oh, okay. I can learn some more about this fascinating area of real estate <laughs> investing. Shall we do that, Thomas? Sure, sure. So we're, we're having our break, folks, and we'll be back in a second. We're coming back, folks. We're going to learn more about this fascinating um, <laughs> part of real estate investing. Off you go, Thomas. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, well, um, God, we're cranking through the time already here. Um, so, uh, Whitney, with, uh, with the investing, I imagine, comes a learning curve. What are some of the pitfalls you see your students go through? Like, what are some of the challenges? Well, like I said earlier, you know, we're all trained to think that we want to cash out. We want a big lump sum of money. And they have a hard time figuring out how to structure the conversation to get around that. All right. Uh, or to chip away at that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it's just in the way that you present a question. You know, you're, we're talking to other adults and we're talking to them about something that we understand and they don't really understand. So as long as you can keep them, uh, you know, speak on their knowledge level of real estate, don't conduct little mini real estate seminars, they do not care. <laughs> yeah. Solve their problem, you know, figure out what's going on with them and then do what you do. They don't care how you do it. Just do it. Okay. And so they have a hard time getting past the no, yeah. or they have a hard time, you know, when I get to the appointment, how much do I tell them? I know I don't want to admit, I mean, I know I don't want to teach a real, a real estate seminar, but you know, what if they want me to move into this house? Well, then just tell them you're not going to move into it. They don't care. They really don't. Right. They just want their money. <laughs> they do. They just, they have a problem, whether it's tenants or making an extra payment or the house is worth less than what's owed on it. Or, you know, they have so many issues. And if you will get past your issues and focus on their issues, mm. I mean, we're just laying down deals all the time. 
You know, there's some wisdom right there. Get past your issues and deal with their issues. I like that. And whatever you're going to be stressed about, whether it's the contract or, you know, what you're going to do after the contract or, you know, how you walk through a house and what if you get a lemon, then that's what they're going to be worried about. Right. Okay, so so and and what we're talking about here, just to be clear for our listeners, is um, I have a house and a challenge. You come to me, and in my mind, I'm thinking I want to cash out, and you're trying to talk me into uh, letting uh, you sell or finance the house and create a monthly income for me instead of a lump sum. Um, and and I would imagine there's some wisdom to that from a tax standpoint alone uh, for some people. Uh, but so. But that's, so if I'm giving you resistance, like, you know, what, what's a common way you combat that? How do you, how do you get around people's uh, mindset of, I need the, the lump sum now? Like, how do you impart your wisdom on them so they see the, the value in the monthly? I mean, why? Why, why, do, I, why do you need it now? <laughs> right. Okay. Is it, I mean, because there's some legit, legitimate reasons that they're going to need the money now. You know, maybe right. somebody's sick and they right. need to pay it off. Right. Maybe they want to buy a lake house. They don't need it. They, just they need only it. need a portion of it. Right. You know, they just think they need it. Their wife wants to redo the kitchen. Well, you don't need that. Right. You know, uh, and th there's lots of reasons, but by asking why, you can figure it out. And a lot of times the people that I'm dealing with, maybe they've tried listing it and it didn't sell. Maybe nobody even wanted to look at it. Maybe they owe what it's worth and they're going to have to bring money to closing to pay the agents for doing their job. And they don't have that. You know, these people aren't regular sellers. Right. And they're not desperate, motivated, depressed sellers either. They have some motivation, but they're not the kind that, you know, wholesalers are going after. I understand. So they're, they're kind of in that in-between ground where they, they're, they're not going to be your typical retail seller, but they have a special need. They're not behind on payments. Right. Uh, I talked to a guy the other day. People forget they have houses. <laughs> he has had a house for three years. Um, I call them bridge people. So you, you get a two one, you live in it until you have a kid or you get too many dogs. You go to a three, two, you keep this one, you're, you know, renting it out, you know, whatever. And then you get another one because you got something else happens. And so now you got two in your bridge and you know, then the kids are in ball and then the parents need this. And suddenly it's just way too much effort to re-rent this house when somebody leaves or these tenants are annoying. We just kick them out. It's only a $500 a month payment. Let's just pay it and not worry about it. Yeah, it hurts a little, but it's not really keeping us up at night. This guy that I talked to the other day has had a house for three years. He hasn't seen it in two years and he's been making the payments on an empty house <laughs> for three years because it's only $300 a month and it doesn't bother him that bad. And yeah, it'd be nice if it went away, but it's not anything pressing that's like worth the effort of getting rid of it wow. so he's actually um what, what's awesome totally different about me is he's in a city with one of my students oh. so instead of me doing the deal because he's perfect i mean he is a perfect seller i set him up with my student and gave my student the lead my student will get the deal my student will make the money and it's good because it's not in my honey hole okay Wow. So there, I, you know, I guess that's what you were saying earlier is like, you know, m m my, my impression would be, there's no way there's people out there like that, but you're finding them left and right. All over the place. So they're out there. If you look for them. All it's, over the place, people have forgotten or they inherited a house and they live three States away and it's too expensive to get on a plane to go to this little dinky town. Whereas I'm in this little dinky town. Let me have it, you know? <laughs> Don't you worry a thing about it. I'll just send you some money. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and you've got a good personality for this. I mean, you're, I can see you're a natural seller. I can see it. So, <laughs> uh, how do you, and let's talk about that for a minute. Let's, how do you take somebody that's maybe not so, uh, compelled to, you know, you, you're, you're a natural conversationalist. You, you don't seem shy at all. So, but you've got some shy people out there. How do you get them over that hurdle? So that's been my struggle because uh. I feel like everybody just knows it. So what I do on, on my weekly group calls with the group or the one-on-one, -on -one, I really try to go through situations. So uh. today on our call, I pretended I was at a house. I went through, you know, I've got some icebreakers that I use that are real estate funny. 
okay. uh, you know, to kind of get the job, to get their ball rolling. Uh, I got a plan, you know, I teach them, you know, where to sit their stuff down, where to position themselves at the table, where, when to start negotiating, how to leave the breadcrumbs. Um, you know, I do a, uh, like, if you're going to say something bad, you do a positive, the negative and a positive so that the seller just remembers the positives. Right. And they didn't feel attacked. Right. You know? Um, so I try to do as much of that as I can. Um, and, you know, I also tell people that it, if I say something and you understand it, but you wouldn't use those words, say it how you would say it. Right. So don't say right. it to pretend to be like me. Put your own spin on it yeah, and it'll be 10 times better than if you were faking like me. Gotcha. Or not faking like me, but pretending to be me. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you meant. They, um, you're... So when your students um, come from um, outside of the real estate world, uh, I would imagine one of their big concerns is you mentioned earlier buying a lemon. What do you do to vet out a home? Like what, what are you doing to make sure you're not buying a lemon? Uh, well, sometimes, you know, you can tell just on a visual inspection. If you get there and there's, you know, a big crack in right. the foundation or the walls are cracked or, um, you know, I, I buy, I'm buying crack houses right now. I'm not buying pretty houses. And uh, a crack house is like, I haven't been in these, but I, I pretend to believe that if you're standing inside, you could see outside through the cracks in the walls and in the floor and in the roof. Like I bought houses before with big old Volkswagen size holes in the roof. Like I'm not wow. scared. I'll buy it. Okay. So, but the best way to make sure you're not doing that is, you know, you can do a, uh, like a visual test so that when you walk into the bathrooms, you know, put your weight down a little bit to see if the floor gives with you or if it's tough. Um, look around for brown spots in the ceiling to see if the roof's leaking. Uh, ask if they've got cast iron pipes or if they've been changed, you know, ask when the updates have been. And, you know, for the most part, if you're looking for something to be wrong with the house, you're going to find it. Right. But if you're expecting that everything is pretty much okay, I mean, think about it. I'm 32. Everything about me is not perfect. This house is 32. There's nothing about it that's perfect. You know, like you got to go with a little bit. So do you ever bring an inspector with you or a contractor? No, I, I am a contractor, but I don't. I, I'll do just a visual inspection. My contract has a, a line in it that says that I can have a full blown inspection if I want it. And if it fails, then I back out. Okay, gotcha. Most of the time, I'm going into houses that need to be gutted anyway. Okay, so so you're so the pro the properties you're buying, um, you're having to do some rehab to them. Sometimes, or I'll do like a lipstick on a pig. Yeah. So I'll go in and I'll just change the kitchen floor. Yeah. Just put a new layer of vinyl down on it, or I'll put a new vanity in the bathroom, or I'll paint the living room, or you know, I'll I'll uh, put new landscaping out, or. I'm trying, I'm really trying not to gut any more kitchens or bathrooms because the way I do them, you know, if I spend 10,000 and then somebody gives me 15,000 to move in, that's fine. But if I could spend 1500 and get somebody to move in for 15,000, right. now I've done better. Right. Yes, yes, Whitney, you must have mentioned kitchens to my co-host. <laughs> He's still having nightmares about his remodeling. I just remodeled a kitchen this year. <laughs> But uh, it's Pandora's box, though. I mean, once you yeah. open it, holy smokes. And once you know it's there, you got to fix it. Yeah, actually, it. actually, folks, I forgot the show, but you must go to uh, I think it was a couple of months ago, our beloved listeners. I think these contractors were actually going to join us in the actual <laughs> episode, actually, weren't they, Thomas? To let Whitney in on the inside joke here, we did one episode where I had to work, I had to do the show from home during the construction, and you could hear the drills and the hammers coming through the podcast. <laughs> I mean, I, I love to flip houses. It, it's yeah. so fun to see something ugly go to something that everybody wants. Yeah. And there's some real satisfaction in that. No, but, I, agree, I agree with you because, I mean, you know, you can get better rent for them too because, you know, I, it's, I have a rental property. I actually was just at it um, the other day up in the Bay Area in uh, San Francisco. And um, I, 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 every year or every other year, whenever it came up for rent, the neighbors would always tell me I'm charging too much for rent. But they were basing it on what their homes looked like, which all these homes were built in the uh, 20s. Uh, but what they didn't realize is that we had done a complete gut job on the house. Um, my wife always used to complain that our tenants lived in a nicer home than we lived in. 
Um, and but they're paying I, your mortgage. That's right. And, and, but and that and I could you know I can charge what I charge because people were fighting tooth and nail to get in there because when they looked at all the other available properties, they realized how nice mine was. Yep. Now you know, but you know, it's Home Depot nice. We don't we don't go ballistic. You know, everything's off the shelf Home Depot, but it's amazing what that'll do to, to clean up a property and make people want to live in it. Well, that's because you don't have a TV show, do you? And you're not getting sponsors to have the $12,000 front door. <laughs> no, no, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point too, huh? HGTV does a number on people, the <laughs> expectation line. There's a reason it's on TV, guys. Right. Amen. <laughs> well, um, Jonathan, I've been hogging the airtime as usual, so uh, I thought I'd let you in uh, as long as you're uh, – Well, wait, I, thought, I thought you were actually going to talk about some actual – real crack houses in, that you've actually uh, had the misfortune to buy. I thought you had a couple of stories. Okay. I can tell you about two. <laughs> okay, so my yard guy had 13 houses. Wow. Okay, if you start talking to people about buying houses, you're going to be amazed at who has houses uh -huh. around you. My yard boy has 13 houses. So I said, well, do you have any crack houses? I mean, I'm wanting to get into something different here. I'm looking for an ugly house. And he was like, I got two, actually. Wow. I was like, great. So the thing is, when somebody gives you a lead, you have to follow up on it. Yeah. That, that's where a lot of people drop the ball on the like third step. Really? Yeah. Drives me crazy. <laughs> so um, he he told me where they were. I went and drove by, called him, and I was like, all right, what do you want for him? And he was like, I don't know, make me an offer. And I said, well, I mean, how about 10000 And he said, each or for both? And I said, both? And he was like, no, nah, I can't take 10 for both of them. And I was like, holy smokes, because I was thinking 10 each. And he was he said, you know, but probably for the package, I could do 12. <laughs> okay uh, that's uh, keeping your mouth shut <laughs> i know it's it's really difficult my husband says he's amazed i can do it sometimes because <laughs> you know i don't uh but uh so he said 12 and i was like so six each and he was like sure why not so we signed the paperwork that day i mean like 24 hours i went from seeing the house didn't get out of the car they were disgusting and it was early in the morning so i felt relatively safe but i'm not going in these houses they're right. crack crack so um I wrote up the contract, 6,000. He was going to owner finance me at $200 a month for the next like three or four years or however long that works out. So I, there's two of them I was buying. So the first one, I decided to do the pretty one first and it had been on fire. Like oh, that, wow. that's how ugly these houses are. Like the pretty one had been on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is, this ugly house thing is totally new for me. I'm in Georgia my stepkids live here. So I caved and moved down. And um, so I've got pretty houses in Tennessee. I've got apartments in Tennessee. I've got land. I've got all sorts of stuff. So I'm in Georgia now and I'm trying a different strategy because oh. I'm new and I'm trying to figure it out. So I've got these two houses and I've got one and I've got it for 6,200 bucks a month. So I advertise it for 15,000 at $300 a month. And it took me about three weeks uh, and I've got all sorts of people going and looking at it and talking and blah, 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 blah. The neighbor calls me and they were like, Hey, um, we think 15,000 is too much. And I said, well, how much do you want to give me? And they said, well, you know, we could do 12,000. There's that magic number again. <laughs> and I was like, well, how much can you give me down? And they said, we'll give you 5,000 down on it. And I was like, oh, okay, how much are you going to pay me every month? They were like, we'll pay the 300 a month. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. So I meet them at the bank. They give me 5,000 cash and we write out the paperwork that they still owe me 7,000 over the next two years. Okay. So I called my seller and I've got 10 steps to get any deal. And step eight is to renegotiate. So I called my seller and I was like, if we didn't do this owner finance thing, how much cash would you take? And he thought for a second, he said, 3,000. Wow. I said, done. We're signing the paperwork in the morning. Wow. So I get, I had 5,000. I gave him three. So I'm down to two. I paid closing costs and, you know, had to get their paperwork done up. So I'm down to 1500 bucks, but I've got this other house of his. Okay. But I cashed him out for three. I've still got $1,500. Uh, then they paid rent the next month, 300 bucks. So I've got $1,800. So again, I called him on the second house because got a lot of activity going on it. And I was like, how much will you take on it? And he said, well, it's not as nice. I'll take 2,500 on it. So I said, fine, done. 
So I took the 1800 that these people had given me. I put 700 with it, probably a thousand because I paid closing costs again, but it's so small. The closing costs are like nothing. Yeah. So I probably got a thousand dollars in my money in this deal and I've got it free and clear. And then I got May's rent, which paid me 300. So now I'm only $700 in the deal. Right. By July, I'll have all my money back on both houses. Wow. And I've got them. The neighbors, they're probably going to pay me off and actually buy that house. But the second house I got, I use it for Facebook ads because it's so ugly and people <laughs> love ugly. They love it. So you have I, a night to be with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did. This is one of my successful boosted posts is I said, hey, all this house is awful. I need to just tear it down. Tag a friend who can help me ta tear this thing down or tag a friend that has an ugly house just like this and I'll buy it from them. Wow. And it went like wildfire. I mean, it was just everywhere. Every redneck in Rome was sharing it and talking about it and <laughs> putting stuff on it and all sorts of stuff. I got another house for $5,500 off that boosted post. Wow. So I spent $15. I bought another crack house. I've got it on Zillow right now for $29,000. i have had $2,000. I've, I've got, because I paid closing costs and we had some back taxes, I think I'm $7,000 in on it. And I've had people offering me 2000 to 5000 to move in and paying me from 400 to 500 a month. So I'll have all my money back on it in six months and selling it for 25 or 29,000. Wow. Gosh. I mean, it's out there. If you, if you, if you just put, if put out the effort to find it, isn't it? You start yakking, you start you talking, if you flap your mouth enough, <laughs> the leads will come. <laughs> Well, uh, Thomas, I, I think we should um, close this discussion. Whitney, um, Whitney's been uh, fantastic fun. Uh, I just thought it was um, Whitney would kind of open the eyes to our listeners to a, a kind of alternative way of making money from investing in property, which they probably weren't aware of, Thomas. Do you think we've been successful with that, Thomas? Absolutely. I mean, I've learned a lot from talking with you, Whitney. I mean, it's, you know, we get too comfortable. We got to get out of our comfort zone sometimes because, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there and you're living proof of that. And I, I mean, it's just a matter of getting out of the comfort zone a little. And it comes down to our pride too. Like I said, our sellers have pride. We have pride. If you'll get rid of yours and help theirs, You'll make the money. Uh, she's dropping pearls of wisdom all over us, Jonathan. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, Whitney, I tell you what, but since we are wrapping up, I want to give you a chance to uh, let people find out how to reach you. Uh, how, how can they get a hold of you? Um, my website is WhitneyNicely.com. Whitney like Houston, nicely like nicely done. Dot com. Uh, and I'm doing a Facebook live 40 lives in 40 days, just spewing free content out every day, every weekday. Oh, wow. And, um, it's facebook.com slash, uh, coach Whitney nicely. But if you Google Whitney nicely, you'll find me. It's an appropriate. I'm all over the place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And Jonathan, how can people reach you? Oh, quite easy folks. You can find the mail, right? USA Facebook page that's Mel Wright USA um, all the uh, interviews are will be on that page you can email me at Jonathan at mail hyphen right.com r-i-g-h-d I do answer my email if you've got any questions about the show any subjects that you want us to cover just give us a, a email and we're trying to get the guest or cover the topic we're here to educate you and make you a more effective real estate agent professional aren't we thomas absolutely and uh, if for me if you want to reach out to me i'm at thomas j nelson realtor.com or you can find me on social media especially facebook and linkedin uh, or do the old-fashioned thing. Give me a call at 858-232-8722. Whitney Nicely, we have had a nice time with you today. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. This was fun. Oh, absolutely. You, you've been a, a breath of fresh air and a ball of energy. <laughs> so, I'm not old and boring. <laughs> well, thank I you. I tell them that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think anyone would mistake you for old or boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for blessing our podcast with your presence. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you back uh, in a future episode to catch up with you. Sounds great. All right. Bye-bye, folks. <laughs>